Namaste, friends. Welcome. All holiday blessings. It is good to be with you. And I thought maybe I'd start with a favorite story. And this I heard back when my son was young in elementary school in the school's art classes. Um, they'd have the children divide up in fours. And as the story goes, this is a um, teacher would be kind of circling around and the children would be drawing at their tables. And one little girl was particularly industrious into her picture. So uh, the teacher asked her what she was drawing and the little girl said, I'm drawing God. And the teacher kind of chuckled and said, well, hon, no one knows what God looks like. And without looking up, without even moving at all, she, the little girl said, they will in a moment. <laughs> I always love that. Um, and it makes me think about John O'Donohue, who's a poet, wise man, no longer alive. And he wrote that we're so busy managing things that we forget this great mystery that we're involved with. And that so resonates for me. And I think of this season, these holy days, and we're often so busy, so fast paced, that we're forgetting the deeper meaning. We're, we're in a trance. At the uh, end of November, just a few weeks ago, Jonathan and I, my husband, did a week-long self-retreat. We did a retreat at home, a lot of silence, a lot of meditation, walking. And the, the great takeaway for me, and it always is this, is how much being off the virtual grid, how much a stretch of intentional presence nourishes me. You know, I stop managing so much. And that means there's more of an openness really to the sense of the sacred, to loving. And to me, that is really the true purpose of the holy days. And I want to say that it's really nice to have a week, but we don't need a week. You know, even the short pauses for presence allow us to open up out of the, um, you know, the habitual planning and worrying, the kind of incessant stories, and we can quiet some. And so our, our minds can settle more into presence. We can find more perspective, more space, more open-heartedness, and touch that sense of being more at home. In retreats over the decades and in daily life, I have returned to one book more than any other over and over again. It's by Sri Narsargadatta. It's called I Am That. And I have my copy here. I want to show you. Um, you can probably see all. The <laughs> and the reason they're all different is because this is really over decades that I've flag now almost every page and underline things. And the reason why is because more than most, he can point to what is beyond words, uh, a felt experience of the mystery in a way that helps draw us to it. So I'll read uh, one that has come back to me over and over again as I go through the pages. When the mind is momentarily free from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you'll find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known and yet you recognize it at once as your own nature. So I wonder what happens to you as you listen to those words. You find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known, and yet you recognize it at once as your own nature. So I 
first encountered this, as I mentioned, decades ago. And for me, it brought up a deep sense of resonance uh, that light and love, it's the truth. It's the essence of who we are. And also a longing that, you know, so often lost in the speedy trance and living from this kind of small self personality, striving, and how we can't fully inhabit the mystery of this life if we're busy managing. Which brings me to today's reflection. And it's really aimed for us ending this year that we can look together at what helps us awaken from the daily trance, at what allows us to live more from this mystery, the fullness of our heart and awareness. So maybe I'll start by touching on some of the habits that support us. And I found that, you know, formal retreats, having them on our schedule and doing them, whether it's a day or a weekend or a week, it's wonderful. And there are elements that we typically do on retreat that are amazing in daily life, make a, a radical difference. And one is simply pausing and having some periods of silence, even short periods of quietness and simply listening. Perhaps when we're walking, not having a podcast piping in our ears or being on a cell phone, but listening to the sounds, whether it's urban sounds or nature sounds. When we're sitting and having some tea or coffee, just taking a few moments, just quiet, just listening. A second is to consciously disengage from activities that distract. And this takes real intentionality <laughs> from the activities that really don't serve us, but they stir us up, um, which could be too much news for some. I want to emphasize cutting back on online activity, um, texting, emailing, tweeting. I, I just deactivated my Twitter account that we use. In my own life, I don't go online until I finished with my yoga and my meditation, whatever other exercises I'm doing in the morning, and really arrived. Um, it really makes a difference to have boundaries around online activity because otherwise our attention is being manipulated and the trance deepens. So, okay, another big one in daily life is slowing down. And by that, I mean, slow down our thinking, slow down our the way we read, slow down the way we move. When we move half as fast, we perceive twice as much. Many of you might know that at Buddhist retreats, the instructions are very explicit to, as it comes naturally, to begin to slow down in walking meditation because so much can wake up. And often people will first go to these retreat centers and it, it looks very otherworldly. People are in slow-mo. <laughs> it looks like zombie-like a bit. I remember my first retreat at the Insight Meditation Society. It's in Massachusetts. And as others had experienced, the whole place was really going slowly. Certain people were moving extremely slowly, microscopically slowly in their walking and also in their eating. And I was really impressed. I thought, okay, these are the super serious senior meditators. And, you know, I thought they were, they were the ones. And I remember a few days in, as I started quieting, I noticed I could slow down and really inhabit the walking. And I remember being outside on my little area that I was walking on, going very, very slowly and thinking, wow, I'm, I'm so collected right now. I'm really noticing all the sensations of aliveness step by step. And then I had this thought, wow, I must look really good. <laughs> It's amazing how the ego wiggles in there, you know. Um, I have to say that since then, I've heard many, many people that have gone to retreats confess how 
they're walking slowly and part of them is imagining how others are watching them walk slowly. So I wasn't alone. But the main point here is, and the reason that we practice slow walking, we are addicted to speed. You know, we're so afraid of not getting everything done, afraid of failing, that we speed up. And we're so afraid of missing out on life, FOMO, fear of missing out, that we speed through, hoping that the next moment will contain what this moment does not. And as you can imagine, if we're racing to the finish line, which is death, it's not a great recipe uh, for life, for living life. I have to say also that even on this recent retreat at home, one morning I noticed I was cleaning up the kitchen and I was speeding around. And I realized, and I do this most days, I have this game, this kind of, it's like I'm trying to game the system really. How efficient can I do things? How fast? Planning the sequence so it's just right. And I caught myself. And then I did pause and I breathed and I said, okay, let's inhabit these, these moments. What a difference to be washing dishes and actually feel the, the warmth and the sudsy bubbles and giving my puppy Katie uh, her meds wrapped in almond butter and she just loved them and watching her enjoy and just the shift from this speedy doing self to an enlarged sense of presence and aliveness. There's a real gift in slowing down. There's a real gift in finding the spaces between, finding the spaces beyond the incessant thinking and stories really slowing down and coming back. Again, I'll, I'll read from Srinur Sargadatta. When the mind is momentarily free from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you find that it is permeated with a light and a love you have never known, and yet you recognize it at once as your own nature. For me, this points to perhaps the most basic way we might understand a path of awakening, which is awakening from a limiting, confined experience of who we are, of self, to realizing who we truly are the vastness and the mystery of who we are, our true nature. We're not getting rid of the self-sense. Rather, we're realizing a larger truth that can include it. There's a story I heard years ago uh, shared by a doctor, and she had had this early morning appointment with an elderly gentleman. And in the middle of the appointment, he, he was in a rush. He said he had to make sure he had a next appointment at nine. And so she asked if he was hurrying to another doctor's appointment. And he said, no, he needed to go to a nursing home to eat breakfast with his wife. And as they continued talking, he shared that his wife had Alzheimer's. And then the doctor asked if his wife might be upset if he was a little bit late. And he replied that she no longer knew who he was, that she hadn't recognized him for over five years. And so the doctor was surprised and said, and still every morning you go, even though she doesn't know who you are. And he smiled and he patted her hand and he said, she doesn't know me, but I still know who she is. In our daily trance, we often miss the light of spirit that lives through others and through ourselves and through all of life. And when I speak of this, I I often use a metaphor of ocean and waves. I find it really helpful that we fixate on the temporary look or shape of a wave and we lose sight of its oceanness. 
of the essential aliveness and vastness and depth of spirit, what the waves are made of. And so instead, we're living in this much smaller world that circles around our story of a separate self. It's kind of a, a collection of a handful of familiar wave patterns. And this is the key when we're talking about suffering and freedom, is the sense of identity, of being living in a kind of limited, small self, and not aware of that, not aware that we're inside that story with its beliefs and feelings. And yet that's the center of our attention, you know, that we move through the day, what is happening to me? What am I doing? What do I want? What do I fear? <laughs> You know, what's wrong with me? What's special about me? It's very self-referenced. And I don't say this in a pejorative way. I remember one of the man at a bar quips is, I know there's no self, but I'm all that I can think about. So I often refer to this as the selfing trance. It's an activity of selfing, of continuously having stories and constructing a sense of a self, and when we're in the selfing trance, others naturally become more objectified. We're seeing their coverings, their ego, not their essence. And again, uh, selfing, centering attention on our own wants and fears, is not a kind of personal badness. It's, it's universal. Like All creatures have a membrane and, and they have the information that says inside this membrane is me, is self, and outside is the world. And then with our complex human brains, we tell stories about that self that deepen our sense of separation. So it's natural and it creates suffering. It creates a suffering actually that can wake us up and evolve us beyond that exclusive identity with a separate self. But first, here's the suffering. Any perception of separation when we're identified with the separate self comes with fear. That's one, one way of saying it. the primal mood of the separate self is fear. And it may not be strong, and it may not be an awareness, but if we feel separate, we're vulnerable, there's a sense that something's missing, that something's wrong, and we're threatened. And, and most thoughts are fear thoughts, trying to survive, planning, worrying, which of course then creates more of the felt sense of separation and fear. This is Wei Wu Wei who says, why are you unhappy? Because 99.9% .9 of everything you do is for yourself. And there isn't one. <laughs> I've always loved that one. Because here we are, and we get caught daily in this selfing trance, and it's painful. Fear, greed, anger, shame, they all swirl around a sense of being a vulnerable, separate self. And the self feels so solid, so real. And then Wei Wu Wei is saying, and there isn't one. <laughs> I, I'm, I know that many of you are familiar with Buddhist teachings of no self in the Pali script, the original language of the Buddha, it's called anatta. And what it's basically saying is that what seems like self, this body, personality, these minds, it's empty of any permanent substance, of any solidity. There's no central self in there. And this is also found in Western thinking. It's beginning with David Hume, who said self is a fiction. This is what neuroscience says, that the self is a construction, that there's no location or actual entity, and yet that sense of a self is continually reconstructed. That's why selfing is a better way to put it. It's continually reconstructed with our thoughts, which gives a sense of continuity to self. So our minds have what's called a default network part of the brain that's dedicated to continually reconstructing the sense of self. And then in quantum physics, and again, I don't have, I mean, I can, I barely understand anything about quantum physics, but the basic contention of nothing exists outside of its relationship with everything else. 
So everything's arising as temporary interconnected manifestations from a quantum field of possibility, empty possibility emerging and manifesting temporarily in a relational way and then dissolving. So again, that's why I like the metaphor of ocean and waves that we construct our identity from a familiar set of waves, thoughts, feelings, beliefs. And yet these waves are always changing. They're inseparable from the activity of other waves and they're essentially filled with ocean. There's no self-existing entity. Although it feels very much like that because our minds keep running a story of who we are. One shaman says, you talk to yourself too much. You're not unique in that. Every one of us does. We maintain our world with our inner dialogue. A person of knowledge is aware that the world will change completely as soon as they stop talking to themselves. Mm. When the mind quiets, the sense of a self starts dissolving which is actually a key to why our mind stays busy. It keeps us in this familiar orientation. And why when we practice meditation, we do begin to quiet and something changes radically. Now the purpose of meditation practice is not to eliminate the sense of self. It's a necessary part of our daily functioning but it's to remember a larger belonging, to have access to that, to remember that sea of being that includes all the waves, that sea of being that really is the one place we can experience the light and love of awareness shining through. Which brings us now to the practices that help us awaken to sensing that oceanness, which are trainings of how we pay attention. I mean, wise attention basically shifts us from trance to reality. It helps us release the exclusive identification with a separate self so that we can realize a larger belonging. And there are two key dimensions or elements in this practice. And the most familiar, what we speak about most regularly, is training to bring a mindful attention to the waves, to what's coming up. So then instead of fixating and being lost in thought, we become mindful of it. Instead of fixating on a physical discomfort or... Um, painful emotion, we become mindful of it. We become aware of the wave. We begin to be able to relate to the waves with kindness, to relate or respond to waves, not to react from them. And in the moment that you notice a wave and you're not inside it, you begin to loosen that clench of identification. This is... uh, Zen poet Ryokan, he writes, to find the truth, drift east and west, come and go, entrusting yourself to the waves. Entrusting yourself to the waves. So we entrust, we relax, we open, we attend with with mindfulness. That's the first dimension of practice in becoming awake to the ocean. Because in the moment that you become aware of waves, that you're witnessing the waves, and you're no longer inside them, you start beginning to directly experience oceanness. And the second part here is to experience that oceanness consciously. Become familiar with the ocean because this is the fruit of mindfulness, this shift of perspective from personal subjectivity to an impersonal awareness of the ocean. And I'm slowing down here and I'm wanting to emphasize this because it's often skipped. 
I find a lot of people practice mindfulness, and as soon as there's some relief or release or opening or a little more perspective, there's a moving on to the next thing. Rather than sensing the actual dimensions of that openness, what's it like? And so the idea here, and especially as you're listening, um, and if some of this sounds unfamiliar or just in some way not relevant to you, just stay curious. <laughs> um, we're going to look more at the nature of oceanness, um, because really the deepening of the path is getting familiar with the awareness that's here and with the inherent qualities of openness, wakefulness, and tenderness. It's really that light and love that Sri Sargadatta was pointing to that gets covered over by the thinking, but it's there. And the more that you recognize and trust that you're the ocean, the less you're afraid of the waves. And the, the add-on to that is when you forget you're the ocean, you'll be seasick every day. <laughs> I really like that. Um, so uh, another story from my recent retreat to kind of give you a sense of these two dimensions in practice, being mindful of the waves and then really becoming familiar with ocean. In the middle of the retreat, I had a, a kind of a stretch where I was, my back was kind of pre-spasming and I was very aware of aging. and of really mortality, you know, just really sensing in the bigger field mortality. I have several very dear beings in my life who are seriously ill, and my dog Katie was in her final days and we knew it. And so a lot of my experience, and it was difficult, was circling around the sense of loss and uh, my own feelings of fragility and my friends and my pop. And I could feel a sense of um, kind of like, how do I start feeling better physically? What can I do? And worrying about my dog and tending to her. And then I just started whispering to myself, in trust to the waves, in trust to the waves. And I remember one time in particular, I was just feeling a kind of anxiety. And as I opened to it, I could feel underneath it very quickly, this, this huge sorrow, this grieving, really about the fragility of life, you know, just, just how it's all coming and going, and, and began to feel tears, and then, of course, a lot of tenderness towards the whole thing. And there had been this movement of being with the waves, and and now mindfulness is bringing just this more um, open, tender space. And I got very still and deepened attention. Just what is this field of awake tenderness like? And there was just this inhabiting of a very pure, wide open, loving, timeless, boundless kind of space. You know, the love and the light of true nature. And there was a sense of every time something would come up, a wave of something, there would be an opening to it and then just surrendering even more deeply. And I'm sharing this particular um, experience because I've been seeing this more and more in the last decade in my life, that the more fully I open to mortality and all the waves that are around impermanence, the more I open to love, that they're inseparable, that opening to the waves of impermanence brings an openness, a tenderness, a wakefulness that's really the ocean itself, very timeless, that behind the appearances behind the feelings, behind the fears, is something incredibly sacred, timeless, and pure. And the more times I open to it, the more trust in that deepens. I want to 
return to my pup, to Katie, because in fact, three days maybe after we ended our retreat, she did die. And the grief is really with me. I can feel it just saying her name, uh, being with the, the pangs and the ache and the sorrow. And it's continued in the same way of just entrusting to those waves and finding over and over again this kind of timeless loving where her form is gone and where can the loving go? You know, it's just what is. You know, I'm aware, I'm sharing with you a very simple, clean kind of grieving. And as we know, there are many threats and losses that are really difficult to open to, ways that are very difficult to entrust ourselves to. So I want to slow down here and say this is our challenge, that we have very deep conditioning to resist, to try to protect ourselves protect that separate self, especially when our most entrenched self-identities are threatened. Rather than open to the waves, we create more waves. I mean, just take a moment to consider how easy is it for you to open to waves when someone is criticized, or insulted, or rejected you? How easy is it when you're fearful about, let's say, your child's mental or physical health, or another loved one's, or when you've made an embarrassing mistake, when you feel your reputation is threatened, or when your finances are threatened, or when your life is at risk. So this is our conundrum in a way that it's incredibly difficult, and yet only by entrusting to the waves you know, contacting our direct experience, do we gain access to the oceanness, to the wisdom and the love, the light of our true nature? I was uh, talking, I think about a month or so ago, to a man who's in our current meditation teacher training, about to graduate, Rex Marco. And Rex is a neurosurgeon. He had a bike accident about three years ago, maybe four, and it left him paraplegic. You can read about him. It's just kind of numerous articles, really. It's very public information. Um, he shared with me how these meditation practices have carried him. And of course, I have great interest because it's one of the areas that I most wonder about is how in the face of dying or losing everything that matters to us, do we find truly a refuge? And he said right from the start, right after the accident, when he realized the dimensions of the damage to his body, and he's a neurosurgeon, he got it, along with the serenity prayer and breathing, his first words that he said to himself were radical acceptance. Now, he, he hadn't read the book, but he knew the meaning of the words, radical acceptance, entrusting yourself to the waves, opening to what is. And he described how some months after the accident, he was motivated to join the teacher training. He already was a, a, a practitioner, but to go deeper into the path for his own healing and also to teach and serve others, which he's doing in powerful ways. He's the chief medical ambassador for the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, in addition to his other medical work. And he's teaching. Uh, and in every engagement, he's an ambassador for the power of mindfulness, compassion. And he gives hope, what I call big T trust, in who we really are. That by opening to what's going on, we can discover something larger that can carry us, a timeless kind of presence in love. He gives hope. Now, as I speak... I'm imagining that many of you listening are familiar with opening to the waves. 
but maybe less familiar with how we actually come to know our oceanness, the formless dimensions of being, that timelessness. So this last part of, of speaking, I really want to emphasize how we become more aware of what we are beyond the self, a formless loving awareness. Because it's such a deep habit to hitch our sense of who we are to something, certain feelings, stories. We have a cluster of self-identities. I'm the doing self that feels very real, or I'm the wanting self, or the fearing self, or the important self, or the failing self. Or we get identified with our roles as parent, or doctor, or we get identified with our gender, or our race, and onward. And so that our daily trance is identity with that limited sense of, I am this, rather than the wholeness, the ocean, that's the source of the waves. In many traditions, the pathway to expose and loosen that narrow exclusive identity is self-inquiry. In some way, we're directly asking, who am I? What am I? We're asking questions because when you direct a question inward, it elicits an atmosphere of curiosity, a kind of uh, beginner's mind that's open for something new. Share a little anecdote where a young boy asks his father, where does the wind come from? And his father says, I don't know. Then he says, why do dogs bark? His father says, I don't know. Why is the earth round? I don't know. And then he says, are you bothered that I'm asking you so many questions? Oh, no, not at all, son. Please ask. Otherwise, you'll never learn anything. <laughs> So this is asking questions, but it's asking questions to our own wise heart. And it's, it's a powerful way to wake up from the selfing trance, to bring this curious attention, this interest in the nature of awareness, to realizing we're conscious and seeking the source of that consciousness. Just right now, realizing you're conscious. There's a consciousness, a sentience, and to seek the source of that. The way Sri Narsargadatta talks about it, he says the I am, what we might call the essence, is usually hitched to feelings, emotions, activities, stories, and that we need to recognize and unhook it to see clearly into our essence. So a, a brief reflection to try to ground this a little. Take some moments to let your attention go inward. And just feel your curiosity, that you can bring curiosity and care to exploring the selfing trance. And you might notice the quality of self as I bring up different situations, whether there's a sense of solidity or centrality. First, think of a recent mistake, something you did wrong, some place that you felt like you fell short, in some way were not enough. And as you do, sense the I am that goes with that, perhaps a failing self in some way. Just how it feels in the body. Now switch to something you did well, something in work or relationship you felt good about. Again, sense the identity there the identity of a successful self. Who are you in that situation? Sense being with somebody who makes you feel insecure. You feel maybe judged by them. Sense the I am, the who you are, 
as more of the self-conscious or insecure self. Just feel it, the felt sense of the I am, the self. And then someone around whom you feel superior. Even if you don't think you should be feeling superior, you just do. And what's the sense of self there? The I am. And when you're in a situation where you're busy, you're in a rush, you had a lot to get done. And sense the self, the doing self. And take a few full breaths. Just notice the different identities. It's interesting, we can have these different identities in different situations. They're all part of that cluster that feels so solid. Now here are some qualities of heart that naturally dissolve the self in trance that you might explore. Take a situation recently where you felt either gratitude for something or someone, or it might have been a moment of awe or wonder at beauty, or perhaps some feelings of love for someone. Just pick a situation where there was that kind of heartfelt goodness, gratitude, awe, love. And you might either put your hand on your heart or put your palms together and whisper, thank you. There's a person involved, you can include their name and then whisper it again. And again. And now again, check and sense the I am, the sense of self. Who's experiencing this right now, this gratitude or beauty or love? What's the sense of your own being like right now? And some may notice that the I am, the sense of our being has more of a quality of openness, more spaciousness, more wakefulness, more warmth. It's less solid, less contracted. This is the ocean. This is an expression of ocean to get familiar with. If your eyes are closed, feel free to open them. Or you can keep them closed as we continue, whichever works for you. There's a liberating power to investigating I am, the sense of who we are, tracing it back and recognizing the, the passing false identities by false meaning they're temporary, they're passing. The wanting self, the insecure self, the superior special self, and increasingly getting it. That's a wave, it's not the essence of who I am. There's a way that when we do, we just naturally release the grip and enlarge. Sri Narsargadatta has a way of describing that, what we enlarge into the field, uh, that personally I have um, gone back to again and again as profoundly resonant. Here's what he says. Love tells me I am everything. Wisdom tells me I am nothing. Between the two, my life flows. Perhaps as you hear these words, something resonates for you too. Maybe even 
without a lot of cognitive understanding, there's something your wisdom mind knows is true. The more that we touch into that truth, that we're living from it, the more in daily life it shows up. That when we're with others, if they're suffering, it feels like our suffering. We just know it's not your suffering, it's our suffering. And when others have joy, humans, dogs, it's sympathetic joy. We feel it too. And when we're with the trees and the natural world, it's the same aliveness. It's not like a hierarchy where we're different and better. We're part of the same field of aliveness. And this belonging is precious. Srinar Sargadatta writes that when you look at anything as separate from you, you cannot love it for you're afraid of it. When you know beyond all doubting that the same life flows through all that is, and you are that life, you will love all naturally and spontaneously. So I want to pause here and say again that the self-entrance is tenacious. Don't get discouraged. Really, what's called for, and this is true for all meditation, is relating to selfing, relating to the ways with kindness. Srinar Sargadatta calls it affectionate awareness. So that you're exploring, you're meditating out of a love for love and a love for truth out of a curiosity of what's beyond this appearance of a small self. So we'll do one more practice of self-inquiry and invite you to, again, bring your interest and gentle attention inward. And you might close your eyes. And let the attention go to the senses. Be aware of listening, hearing the sounds that are here. Let them wash through you. Be aware of the aliveness in the body, the sensations. feeling your face, letting it soften, feeling the sensations there, your hands softening, sensations, loosening the belly, feeling the breath deep in the torso, being aware of the felt sense in the heart area. Senses wide open. And now inquire, who is this happening to? Who is listening and feeling right now? And see if you can find the sense of a self that's listening and feeling, that sense of an I am, that in some way is the place where you locate the sense of self. Just notice, is there a sense of a self behind the eyes maybe? Or for some it's kind of located in the throat heart area. Where is the self located? Is there an image, a sense of a seated form? Just feel the self where it's localized from inside. And now, sense what is witnessing this self. Where's the witness? Is there a vague sense of a witnessing from outside of you, maybe in front of you, looking down at you? Or is the witness behind you? You might listen to these words. As you watch your mind, 
you discover yourself as the watcher, the witness. When you stand motionless, only watching, you discover yourself as the light behind the watcher or the witness. That source alone is. Go back to that source and abide there. The light behind the witness. Can you sense the light, the awareness that's interior? As if you're feeling the sensations in your heart, but feeling the interior space of awareness that's aware of those feelings. And you can you feel how that awareness pervades your body through everywhere, that everything is felt, is felt by awareness inside you, through you, and everywhere around you listening to the sounds and sensing the awareness that extends boundlessly. Relax and be that awareness, that all-pervading awareness, the light behind the witness. Love tells me I'm everything. Wisdom tells me I'm nothing. Between the two, my life flow. Take a few breaths if you'd like, eyes closed or open. The more that we experience and trust the oceanness of our being, who we are beyond a separate self. As I mentioned, it shows up in how we move through the world. You'll be more quick to remember what matters. You'll notice that. And you'll find a natural kind of kindness and gratitude and wisdom comes forward. And as we've been speaking a bit in this exploration, when you encounter loss, there's a sense of what holds it. Thich Nhat Hanh expresses this wisdom in a way that's touched me deeply. His mother died, and he experienced that as one of the great misfortunes of his life, and he grieved for her uh, for more than a year. That's kind of entrusting himself to the waves after a wave of grief. And then she appeared to him in a dream. And in it, they're having a wonderful talk, and she was young and beautiful. And he woke up in the middle of the night and had the distinct impression that he had never lost his mother. She was alive in him. And when he stepped outside his monastery hut and began to walk among the tea plants, he still felt her presence by his side. And as he says so beautifully, she was the moonlight caressing me as she had done so often, very tender, very sweet. And continuing to walk, he sensed that his body was a living continuation of all his ancestors and that together he and his mother were leaving footprints in the damp soil. So in my understanding, his year of opening to the waves of grieving allowed him to find refuge in that sea of timeless loving. Opening to the waves gave refuge in that sea of timeless loving. And I've been sharing stories of loss. Um, me, with Rex, a man with his wife who had Alzheimer's, Thich Nhat Hanh. And the reason is because we habitually defend against feeling that loss, against impermanence. And every time we do, in all those moments, it solidifies a sense of being separate and threatened. And the invitation here, as we close, is to entrust to the waves, to the all the waves, the whole range of them, including the experience of personal loss, 
and to discover that which is eternal, the infinite sea of loving, of being. And in this talk, I started, if you'll remember back, with that little girl who was drawing God, because we lose sight of the mystery. You know, we get lost in managing in that, in that self of trancing. And I thought I'd end with a story that Srinur Sargadatta told of his own awakening from trance. And he says, my guru, before he died, told me, believe me, you are the supreme reality, the divine, the source, pure awareness. He said, don't doubt my words. Don't disbelieve me. I'm telling you the truth. Act on it. I could not forget his words. I pondered that for several years until I knew that it was the truth, until I became it. He added, I was lucky because I trusted what I was told. So, my friends, if we're sincere, if we have a love for love, if we have a love for truth, there's no limit to what's possible. And it's powerful to enter the new year feeling that possibility, feeling that dedication to awaken to our heart and spirit. My prayer as we close is that we may each live from the awareness that is the source, that light and love. And may all beings be happy, peaceful, free, awaken to that same shared field of light and loving. Namaste and blessings. <laughs>